station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. CBS News, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Bill Harwood, CBS News in Florida. How do you read me? Hey, Bill, we have you loud and clear. How are you doing today? Hey, we're doing great, and thanks so much for joining us today. And, uh, you know, Shane, going into this Fourth of July weekend, uh, my wife asked me a question today, and I was embarrassed I couldn't answer it. She said, can astronauts see fireworks from space? And I looked at my tracking app, and I don't think you'll be over the state Sunday night during that time. But just in general, have you ever heard of astronauts being able to see fireworks from orbit? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And Tama and I got to experience that on our last flight when we were here for New Year's Eve. So we did see fireworks all over the world, literally, um, as we were going around on New Year's Eve. So that was pretty cool. But like you mentioned, um, we're not going over the U.S. Um, at the correct time uh, this coming Sunday, unfortunately, to see any fireworks. And we'd probably be asleep anyway. It'll be one or two in the morning up here for us. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Uh, well, that's cool. That's pretty neat. Are you guys doing anything special for the holidays uh, stateside? Um, well, up here we're going to do a few things. We're going to kind of have like a cookout barbecue, or at least we're going to simulate that with the food that we have up here. But we're going to share that with, uh, you know, our French astronauts, our Japanese and Russian colleagues, and share some of the traditions we have around the table. Um, I also get a chance to do a live um, event on Sunday with a church service from Atlanta, so a gathering there. And that's going to be really special for me to be part of that Fourth of July service. Shane, you know why you got the mic and you were talking about food, Tama indicated in a tweeter on his Instagram page, can't remember which, that he wasn't a very good cook, and he said he was embarrassed to be a Frenchman and have uh, less than stellar culinary skills. So what do you think of his uh, his cooking efforts? Oh, don't listen to Tamai on that. He's good at everything, so I'm sure in the kitchen is, <laughs> is no different. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Well, look, let me ask you guys a couple of questions about the uh, Yara Rosa EVAs, and you know, the first EVA, when you guys ran into that clearance problem, it wasn't clear to me on the ground anyway that there was a physical interference issue or if it was just a question of getting familiar with the installation on the mod kit. So tell me a little bit, just a little bit about how that was, how that went. Yeah, it was uh, it was really special to be part of that series of EVAs. Um, it was very challenging. Went all the way at the at the end of the space station. And as a matter of fact, you can you can see if you like look out the window, you can see. I don't know if you see it. It might be too bright, but you see the solar rays right behind us, um, kind of floating nicely now on space station, and we're very proud of them. But yeah, for the first EVA, we didn't expect the clearance to be so tight um, because it's challenging because this hardware was built, you know, by different people, different companies. It never obviously saw uh, its final location it was in space so there's a lot of engineering that went into it and it was so simple as to kind of a misalignment problem uh, but uh, luckily the, the, all the engineers at NASA uh, turned around really really quickly and between the first and the second EVA we shifted gears we, have, we had a different strategy um, and it, it worked beautifully it worked like a charm so it was just a matter of doing the right thing um, and uh, that's what we did for the second and the third EVA and now uh, they're floating nicely behind us. Well, obviously, you got uh, two more sets of those arrays coming up that will get installed, I guess, next year. Any lessons learned uh, other than that for the crews that will install those next EVA, uh, those next uh, solar panels? Yeah, we'll have a lot of lessons for them. And, uh, you know, just, just handling a mass that, that big, about 750-pound mass that we had to deal with was very challenging, um, a bit surprising. We, we do some virtual reality back home to, to do some mass handling with things like that. But... Nothing like the real thing, and Tama and I were, I would say, a bit surprised uh, on the EVAs that we actually handled them on EVA 1 and EVA 3. It's a really good workout, even though, you know, things don't weigh anything in space. It's a workout when you're handling a mass that big and you're moving around and trying to kind of balance the motion of that with, in Tama's case, on the robotic arm, and in my case, just in a foot restraint. So very challenging, and we'll definitely pass back a lot of uh, feedback for the future crews that are going to do this here next year. And Shane, I know you guys don't pay much attention to stats like this, but you're now 11th on the list of most experienced spacewalkers. Does it ever get routine floating out the hatch? Uh, from my perspective, no. Um, these three EVAs that Tama and I just did, they were 
our uh, what third, fourth, and fifth together. So that was pretty cool. Um, to me, that's a, a, a better record than whatever he has mentioned before. Um, but these were really, really challenging. Um, and we've we've done EBAs together. We've done them, um, you know, other ones before. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it was the the mass that I mentioned earlier, or just the complexity of these EBAs. They were really challenging. So um, in that respect, it was definitely was new to us, uh, new hardware, new team that we were working with. And uh, it was an amazing team, like Tomaj mentioned earlier, we got to accomplish the mission here and get those two new solar arrays installed. But um, it was it's never easy going outside. It's always hard, but these were just an extra level of complexity and uh, toughness. Yeah, they're really, really neat looking out there. Uh, I'm going to shift gears here for a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm sure you guys know Richard Branson's going to be flying a suborbital flight uh, a week from Sunday, and then nine days later, Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin is going to be uh, going up. I mean, uh, they're not going to orbit, obviously, but it seems like a milestone in the commercial space program anyway. What do you guys think about all that? Is it is it worth all the attention that's going to get? Uh, what kind of mile, How do you view it? I think generally uh, we we think it's good. We think it's good that uh, that people invest into space. We we're not doing it, you know, just to be the members of a, of an exclusive club. We're doing it because we think it's useful. We think there's a lot of there's a lot of gains for society, you know, by going into space, whether it be for the research or for the economy that we could develop in lower orbit and further and beyond. And and really the parallel that I draw, which is very it's very basic, but it's true. It's if you look at aviation at the beginning, um, you know, there was a lot of pioneering, and then it was seen as a, as a luxury only for you know a bunch of happy few, and then it became uh, what it is today. Now it enables people to travel around the world and learn about other cultures and, and meet up people. It makes kind of makes the world a better place. Um, so we're hoping that that space flight is going to have the same trajectory. We think we're on that path. We think that's what we're trying to do uh, at our level, and the agencies are trying to do. So uh, opening up to to public private partnership and to and to private uh, enterprise in the lower source orbit in lower source orbit is definitely a part of that. You know, there's also a, a I guess a neatness uh, aspect to all this. Jeff Bezos has invited Wally Funk to fly with him. She was one of the 13 women who originally hoped to fly in space back in the 1960s. Uh, Shane, any words you'd like to pass along to her? She's going to be 82 and the oldest person to ever fly in space. Uh, that's really fantastic. I want to wish her well, of course, and uh, what a what a perfect choice um, to go into space uh, and kind of, you know, kind of put a little cherry on top of her amazing career. So that's pretty awesome. Well, you know, speaking one more on commercial space, uh, you guys are going to be dealing with that on the station yourselves, obviously. The Russians are going to send up an actress and a producer in, uh, in, in this fall, and then, of course, you got a Jap two Japanese space tourists going up uh, in December, and then you've got the Axiom mission in January. What do you what do you think about the station in terms of commercial crew on board, uh, training, safety, all those things uh, from the perspective of a professional astronaut? I think all those crews you mentioned. I mean, we're excited. Um, we'll be up here. Uh, we think at least for the Russians, the Russian one you mentioned. And uh, we're excited to have them on board. They're going to get trained all around the world at the training centers, just like we do um, on the emergency equipment and the safety aspect of it. So we're not concerned, I don't think, about that at all. Um, their missions will be shorter in general, so, you know, a week or so-ish um, for their missions. And so they won't get to experience this like we do, but they'll have a nice, you know, view of the, you know, the Earth from this perspective and get to do some science up here while they're here. Um, and so I don't have any issues with it at all. It's going to be really exciting to me. It's kind of that, and Tama was alluding to it earlier, it's the next step um, in this process to get, um, you know, this whole commercial entity and private enterprise as part of this low Earth orbit deal that we've been doing for a little while now. So, you know, NASA committed a couple years ago, I think about two years ago exactly, um, to create this kind of business and commercial aspect of the International Space Station. And it's, you know, this this next year, it's going to really start start moving pretty quickly. So we're really excited about it. Well, look, guys, uh, that pretty much takes care of me. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. Best of luck with the rest of your mission and uh, hopefully be talking down the road. Thanks, Bill. Happy 4th. You too. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our CBS News portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from ABC News. Station, this is Sam Sweeney with ABC News in Washington. How do you hear me? Hey, Sam, we have you loud and clear. Sorry, we're getting back into place. 
Scott Sorry, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us this morning. I wanted to talk about that big news. Richard Branson, I know you just mentioned it with CBS, uh, announcing that he's going to beat Jeff Bezos. He says it's not a race, but what do you guys think? Well, everybody says it's not a race. I think, I think it's good. I think you need some momentum. You need, uh, and uh, you know, being competitive is kind of part of the part of the process. So um, it's okay. I mean, it's a challenging environment. You set yourself goals. You set yourself challenges, and you try to give the best of your abilities. It's it's part of it. Um, so you know, we we think overall this is a this is a positive process. We think uh, space needs to open up to uh, you know to more of the general public, to to private enterprises, and and to all these initiatives. Uh, we think it's good. We think it's going to have a, a very positive impact for everybody in the future. Uh, and so we're glad to be part of it. What do you suggest that the uh, first civilians bring? Well, those folks are going to go for a very short duration, so they probably won't have to uh, have the opportunity to bring a lot. Uh, but the ones that are going to come up here for a week or so later in the fall, you know, bring uh, obviously maybe pictures of their families and little mementos um, from their maybe universities or or teams that they enjoy, just like we do. Um, and so hopefully they'll get a chance to do that and then maybe present those items back to those um, entities when they get home. A lot of people don't uh, understand exactly what you know, the crew on board the International Space Station is doing, but your every day it's critical scientific research. What research is that, what, what's the impact for, for Americans here that you guys are doing each day? Well, so there's a, there's a there's a million experiments that really happen on the, on board the ISS. I mean, recently what we've been doing in the recent weeks, I was working on a on a muscle experiment on microscopic worms that have actually a lot of DNA in common with human beings, believe it or not. Uh, so we're looking at how spaceflight affects their their muscle, their, uh, their muscle cells, and uh, how to counteract this effect. Uh, because as you know, we're losing muscle mass, and it's kind of it's kind of a the similar process as aging on the ground. So if we could find Find a way to reverse that process and kind of unlock the key to aging uh, as far as muscle but also bone also brain and vision and a lot of other topics then that would be fantastic for everybody on earth so that's just one of the aspects of what we're doing up here on the ISS but we're doing material science we're working on new alloys we're working on uh, you know the immune system we're working on a, on a million different things and that what that was that's what makes it so special every day for us over the last couple of weeks UFOs have made uh, major headlines here in the US uh, Navy pilots spotting them on a regular basis, but we haven't gotten any uh, conclusive evidence of where they're coming from or what they are. Have you guys seen anything or do you have any ideas? No, it's the first I've heard of it. Um, we have certainly not seen anything. We would uh, definitely report that and have good video and pictures if uh, we could, but uh, we've not seen anything up here and uh, I haven't even heard about what you just mentioned, so I'll start looking for that in the news. Okay. We have a question from a student, Maeve Gleason, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and she has a question about space junk and if it's an issue, if you guys are seeing this increase, and, and what are your concerns about it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is definitely an, an issue. It's not an everyday thing. It's not as if we would look out the window and and see a debris and things floating because space is so vast, it's so big. Um, but it's going to be you know one piece of hardware every you know so many miles or kilometers. It's all being tracked uh, by ground stations on the ground. And if we need to take measures to avoid if we have a conflicting trajectory, then we would we would fire our thrusters on the space station and kind of raise our orbit and make sure we don't get into a, uh, get into a conflict or anything dangerous for us. And for the and for the ship, um, it's there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of debris in lower orbit, um, and we need to do better in uh, not creating them and even cleaning up the lower orbit. All the space agencies in the world now they have projects to to send up some uh, specific satellites and specific spacecraft to kind of clean up lower orbit. Um, but it's good. I mean, it starts by not creating more, and I think now there's a there's a common effort by everybody in the world who launches satellites to to try and not create more debris, and that's how it starts. I see a lot of wires, a lot of computer systems. Do you guys have access 24-7 to Internet and email, and do you keep up with the news at all? 
Um, we can't keep up with the news. Uh, we do have internet access up here. It's not the greatest, <laughs> so it's it's uh, much better than it was four years ago when Tama and I were here. Um, so we definitely made some improvements, but uh, we can call home. We can uh, we have a TV channel that you can stream live, um, so we could get news or sports or whatever we want in that regard. Um, typically, we also get TV shows or news shows sent up to us, but they're usually a day behind or so. Um, so we do have some avenues to stay in touch with uh, planet Earth and what's going on. Shane, you were talking earlier about the spacewalk that you did. I know there was an issue with your helmet. What would have happened if you lost that? Um, so, well, it was, yeah, if you lose your helmet, that's really bad. But <laughs> but uh, the, the mechanism that came off were the light, kind of the lights on top of my helmet and the cameras up there. And then actually it happened to Tama, too, on the same spacewalk just towards the end. And so it's connected um, by, a, by a string, and so it's not going to go anywhere unless that came undone as well. And if so, obviously that would, that would be some debris out there that we'd have to worry about down the road. Um, Tama, if you didn't hear, he, he did a nice little fix on it for us to kind of get through the rest of the spacewalk. And then when his came off later in the spacewalk, we were already at the airlock coming inside, so we didn't really do anything for that one. We did put some measures in place for the, the spacewalk after that to make sure it didn't happen again, and we were very successful there with the, the plan that the ground team came up with. So um, anyway, it's happened before. It wasn't the first time this has happened, but uh, it's a mechanism that we hope doesn't uh, come off, obviously, while we're outside. You mentioned July 4th. I want to know what you guys are going to be eating um, and how you celebrate. I, I understand that the Russians will be joining you. Oh, yeah, we're going to have a, uh, I would say, a big kind of picnic dinner um, on Sunday afternoon, late afternoon, where we're going to try to, you know, recreate some of our traditions back home. You know, I think normally we'd be cooking out and those kind of things. Well, we can't do that, but we do have some hamburgers and we have some brisket and uh, baked beans and corn and those kind of you know, cobblers and things that we normally have back home, and we're going to enjoy those up here with, with our French, Japanese, and Russian colleagues um, up here on Sunday afternoon. So that'll be fun. When do you see a time when it's, it's more normal for, um, you know, not just billionaires and lucky winners of uh, raffles to come and, and join you on the International Space Station? Oh, it's a, you know, it's a process. If you look back, I mean, I always, I always look back at history to kind of pick up the trends. And, and if you look at aviation, it, it, took, uh, it took a few dozen years before it, it became kind of a, a mass product. Um, and I think spaceflight, we've been sending people to space for 50, 60 years, which is, seems long because now our expectations are so high, but it's not that much. I mean, um, back in the day, 50 years after Columbus got to America, I'm not sure lots of stuff had, had happened. So uh, we're actually going fast, I think, but uh, but we're getting there. So now we've, if you look at it, we've um, we've settled pretty much. We've had people in lower orbit for more than 20 years now uh, without a pause. People have been living in space for 20 years, so that's a that's a pretty big achievement, if you're asking me. Um, and now and now professional astronauts are going to take one step further and deeper. Um, we've been to the moon. The the U.S. has been to the moon in the, in the 70s, but not for so long. Now we want to go back as an international project, just like the ISS is, uh, with a sustainable approach, kind of live off the land, in situ resource utilization, um, things like that, and have a more permanent presence uh, because as part of the as part of the exploration process. And then while doing this, then uh, we'll leave. Not entirely, but we'll uh, we'll uh, have more less attention from uh, professional agencies in lower orbit, and then the private enterprises are going to fill up that void and are going to follow behind, and then it's going to be the same on the on the moon when we go to Mars, and and so that's a, that's a whole process that we are that we're seeing happening today, and that's going to keep happening in the future. And as you guys accomplish all that, you now have more competition. The Chinese now launching their first space station. Will you have any interaction with them or, or work with them at all? Uh, we will not have any interaction with them. Um, I think, well, at least in the U.S., um, there are laws that prevent us from working with them, unfortunately. But hopefully, one day that'll those barriers will be broken down, and we can all, you know, have you know a huge partnership um, as we go explore the solar system. And I will thanks, guys, so much for for your time. I appreciate it, and um, looking forward to learning more about your missions. Hey, thanks a lot. It was fun to have you on board the ISS, and happy 4th of July. You too. Enjoy it. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event.
Thank you to all participants from CBS News and ABC News Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.